I thought we'd look at ethnographic design. And ethnography is the study of people. It's a subset of anthropology. And it's an important tool for the designer because it lets you get insights into people's uh, behaviors and desires <clears throat> that is rooted in a, a, a structured technique that extracts a lot of information unrelated to the function of the design. And uh, ethnography tries to extract truths from a small population with uh, a richly textured uh, subjective uh, assessment of a small population. In other words, you can find out someone's foot size by measuring their feet, but you can't find out what their motivation is with a tape measure. So there's a lot of, or what shoe they prefer uh, in terms of aesthetics and so on. I mean, there's a lot of uh, information that doesn't lend itself to, to the sort of the positivistic approach to uh, design. So ethnography is a, is a great tool in your tool belt. And it's not a trivial tool. We're all ethnographers of sorts because we deal with people and we know the nuances of people's behavior and we can read people well and, and we all, ha all have those uh, skills. But if in ethnography, you're actually using more structured elements of data acquisition, such things as uh, questionnaires and surveys in different forms. And the ethnographer is, becomes the instrument of his or her own epistemology. So it's, it's going through, and we, and we talked earlier about positionality. So uh, you're acquiring data by talking to people, by watching people, and then you're processing that in some fashion and presenting, presenting it as data. And the qualitative methods for, for working with that data, I'm not gonna look at too much, but that's a really interesting area and uh, uh, worth further exploration. But as an ethnographer, you can sort of take two, three roles, really. There's the participant, where you truly are a participant in, the, in a group that you're studying. So if you're looking at um, um, carpenters, if you really work as a carpenter, your co-workers recognize that you're a co-employee, but you're surreptitiously uh, being an ethnographer, you're taking notes and maybe photographs and, and such. Uh, that's participant uh, ethnography. Uh, more typical, well, you have uh, participant observer uh, structures where you are doing the work with the group, but they know that you're observing them. And then you have the complete observer where you're just watching someone else work or, you, or use a tool or, or whatever the case is. So, so those are sort of three categories of, uh, of ethnography. And then, too, with the data that you obtain, you know, what is the form of it? It can be really regimented. So, for example, you can tape record conversations and, and uh, look for keywords and do a discourse analysis and find out how often certain keywords are used and, and that sort of thing. It can be thematic where you find reoccurring themes that arise. And we looked at that before when we considered affinity diagrams, too. So uh, that's part of the, the way ethnographers can assess and parse data. Because if I just throw a bunch of videos at you or uh, transcripts or whatnot, that doesn't, isn't very helpful. So you have to distill it in some fashion. So uh, thematic analysis is really a good way of taking a lot of data and, and making some sense of it. Uh, when you look at ethnographic design, what we're doing here is we're saying there's two, kind of two worlds that we're considering. One is the mechanistic. What does the design actually have to do? If you're, if you're designing a hammer, well, it's got to drive in a nail. That's what it's got to do. Uh, and then there's a non-mechanistic, which is, a, which is asking a lot of the other questions. So anything from, uh, is there a pride that a carpenter has in his, in his hammer? Is there a color preference? Is there something else that a hammer could do or should do, like remove nails? Uh, is, is there, uh, uh, ergonomics sort of falls into the, uh, the ethnographic or, or the uh, mechanistic side, but still it's, uh, uh, it's part of the, the mix when you look at design. But these non-mechanistic things can go much further because you can deal with material culture, uh, uh, belief systems, these sort of things. You know, what, what, is, what are the things that are associated with an object that don't actually uh, contribute to it, its doing its job? And uh, within that, we can look at some things like design culture. What do the people that you're studying um, value? What does their government value? What's in their museums? What's on their stamps? What's on their currency? What does their monumental architecture look like? Uh, does that reflect their values? Uh, what values does it reflect? But you can find this, you can get a sense of the design culture from uh, an assessment of these sort of uh, uh, projections of design 
Uh, you can see it in museums and these sort of things. Obviously, that's imperfect, but you can get a uh, you can look at what people hang up in their homes and, and all these sort of things to get an idea of what design culture looks like. Uh, also, visual stereotypes, which we had talked about before. What do people expect to see in a hammer or in a pen or in a desk? Uh, and, and that's sort of the starting point for design in some ways. So that, again, can be approached ethnographically. In that case, it's a little more structured. You can take photographs and, and overlay them and see how, uh, how much things vary from some typical look. And, uh, for example, when someone buys a hot dog, they want it to look a certain way. When someone buys a, a pickup, they want it to look a certain way. Uh, not that you can't deviate from that, but that's what they're expecting. In fact, it begs the question, does the culture um, nurture deviations from the norm in that regard? Do, do people show off their new uh, smartphone? Or is it such a commodity that nobody cares anymore? Does something have an heirloom quality or, or, or things like this? So that's, that's part of the ethnographic design, too. Um, then aesthetics, too, can come into play. What do people consider to be uh, appealing? And how do you find that out? Well, colors can be sort of the easiest thing, in a way. Uh, not always, but they can be. And, uh, but there can be many other things that contribute to aesthetics, too. So uh, that's really for another talk, the whole realm of aesthetics. But, Ethnographic design is important. The, the basic notion of it is that you, uh, you become the, the instrument of your epistemology, that you study people in, in a structured way with some validity, with a uh, consideration of biases that come into play, like so, social acquiescent biases and, and other types of biases that can, uh, that can disturb the data, that you recognize that it's subjective, and that you work with data, whether it's photographs, transcripts, recordings, uh, sort of the, uh, uh, even to some degree memory, in such a way that there's rigor to it and that you can parse truths out that apply to something. Uh, so you know your position with respect to what you're trying to do, you recognize your own biases, and then you, you watch people, you study people, and you ask them questions, and you listen, listen, and look, and look, and when you get the data, you lay it all out and say, you know, I'm seeing some connections here. I'm seeing some problems there. And, uh, and it gives you ammunition to work with in design. It's a big topic. Uh, for example, one of the things we do is we have a, a checklist. So if you're assessing an environmental space, you can say, what's the dominant color? What's the dominant visual? What's the dominant sound? Uh, what's, uh, what demographics are in the store? Uh, these sort of things. So I can go to certain stores and they're screaming out, middle-aged man, go away, because they have obnoxious uh, music, they have dark lights, they have clothing that I would not think to wear, all sorts of things. So as an ethnographer, you're asking the question, what is it about the store that's encouraging middle-aged people to leave and perhaps thereby encouraging young people to visit? And you don't do that with the tape measure. So uh, it's a great example of ethnography. And the same is true with design, because if you're working with something, a, a, a product, for example, you look at how people actually use the product that currently exists, and you try to find out what improvements they want to make. Well, how do you do that? Well, you can ask them, and that's certainly true. But then you have this, uh, well, you have many issues that arise, where one, they're, they're maybe trying to tell you what you want to hear, or they're off in blue sky country somewhere, or uh, they don't really know what they want, and that's the whole realm of advanced design, which is another interesting topic, designing for, uh, designing something that people don't know that they want, but they will want it once you design it. Uh, you see it a lot in the virtual world, certainly. So, uh, as an ethnographer, an ethnographic designer, you're, you're watching somebody do a process and saying, you know, uh, he, he keeps picking up this tool and putting it in this one certain place. Why does he do that? And how do you find that out? Well, watch a bunch of other people. If they're doing the same thing, you're seeing a repetition of the pattern there that, that has some significance. And you can ask why they put the tool there, but you've, or you can deduce from other data why they put the tool there. Uh, and uh, it, it's a fascinating area. It's very much tapping into our, our wonderful skills of assessing other people. Uh, the challenge is to elevate it to a more formal state, you have to have insights into qualitative methods, analysis methods, and dealing with data. And uh, you know, there's a little bit more to it than just watching people, but it's a, it's a powerful tool, 
and uh, I, I think it's going to be growing in import as we look at designing for other cultures. Thank you.